William Bradford Shockley Jr. was an American physicist and inventor. Shockley was the manager of a research group that included John Bardeen and Walter Braddon. The three scientists invented the point contact transistor in 1947 and were jointly awarded the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics. Shockley's attempts to commercialize a new transistor design in the 1950s and 1960s led to California's Silicon Valley becoming a hotbed of electronics innovation. In his later life, Shockley was a professor of electrical engineering at Stanford University and became a proponent of eugenics. Early Life and Education Shockley was born in London, to American parents, and raised in his family's hometown of Palo Alto, California, from age three. His father, William Hillman Shockley, was a mining engineer who speculated in mines for a living, and spoke eight languages. His mother, Mary, Nay Bradford, grew up in the American West, graduated from Stanford University, and became the first female U.S. Deputy Mining Surveyor. Shockley received his Bachelor of Science degree from Caltech in 1932. Shockley received his Ph.D. degree from MIT in 1936. The title of his doctoral thesis was Electronic Bands and Sodium Chloride. His thesis topic was suggested by his thesis advisor, John C. Slater. After receiving his doctorate, Shockley joined a research group headed by Clinton Davison at Bell Labs in New Jersey. The next few years were productive ones for Shockley. He published a number of fundamental papers on solid state physics in Physical Review. In 1938, he got his first patent, Electron Discharge Device, on Electron Multipliers. Career When World War II broke out, Shockley became involved in radar research at Bell Labs in Manhattan, New York City. In May 1942, he took leave from Bell Labs to become a research director at Columbia University's Anti-Submarine Warfare Operations Group. This involved devising methods for countering the tactics of submarines with improved convoying techniques, optimizing depth charge patterns, and so on. This project required frequent trips to the Pentagon and Washington where Shockley met many high-ranking officers and government officials. In 1944, he organized a training program for B-29 bomber pilots to use new radar bomb sites. In late 1944 he took a three-month tour to bases around the world to assess the results. For this project, Secretary of War Robert Porter Patterson awarded Shockley the Medal for Merit on October 17, 1946. In July 1945, the War Department asked Shockley to prepare a report on the question of probable casualties from an invasion of the Japanese mainland. Shockley concluded, quote, If the study shows that the behavior of nations in all historical cases comparable to Japan's has in fact been invariably consistent with the behavior of the troops in battle, then it means that the Japanese dead and ineffectives at the time of the defeat will exceed the corresponding number for the Germans. In other words, we shall probably have to kill at least 5 to 10 million Japanese. This might cost us between 1.7 and 4 million casualties including 400,000 to 800,000 killed. End of quote. This report influenced the decision for the to force Japan to surrender without an invasion. Shockley was first to propose a distribution to model the creation process for scientific research papers. He was an atheist. Development of the Transistor Shortly after the end of the war in 1945, Bell Labs formed a solid-state physics group, led by Shockley and chemist Stanley Morgan, which included, physicist, chemist Robert Gibney, electronics expert Hilbert Moore, and several technicians. Their assignment was to seek a solid-state alternative to fragile glass amplifiers. Its first attempts were based on Shockley's ideas about using an external electrical field on a semiconductor to affect its conductivity. These experiments failed every time in all sorts of configurations and materials. The group was at a standstill until Bardeen suggested a theory that invoked that prevented the field from penetrating the semiconductor. The group changed its focus to study these surface states and they met almost daily to discuss the work. The rapport of the group was excellent and ideas were freely exchanged. By the winter of 1946 they had enough results that Bardeen submitted a paper on the surface states to 
Bratton started experiments to study the surface states through observations made while shining a bright light on the semiconductor's surface. This led to several more papers, one of them CO authored with Shockley, which estimated the density of the surface states to be more than enough to account for their failed experiments. The pace of the work picked up significantly when they started to surround point contacts between the semiconductor and the conducting wires with S. Moore built a circuit that allowed them to vary the frequency of the input signal easily. Finally they began to get some evidence of power amplification when Pearson, acting on a suggestion by Shockley, put a voltage on a droplet of glycol borate, a viscous chemical that did not evaporate, commonly used in electrolytic capacitors, and obtained by puncturing an example capacitor with a nail, using a hammer, placed across a. Bell Labs attorneys soon discovered Shockley's field effect principle had been anticipated and devices based on it patented in 1930 by, who filed his like patent in Canada on October 22, 1925. Although the patent appeared breakable, it could not work. The patent attorneys based one of its four patent applications only on the Bardeen Bratton point contact design. Three others, submitted first, covered the electrolyte based transistors with Bardeen, Gibney, and Bratton as the inventors. Shockley's name was not on any of these patent applications. This angered Shockley, who thought his name should also be on the patents because the work was based on his field effect idea. He even made efforts to have the patent written only in his name and told Bardeen and Bratton of his intentions. Shockley, angered by not being included on the patent applications, secretly continued his own work to build a different sort of transistor based on junctions instead of point contacts, he expected this kind of design would be more likely to be commercially viable. The point contact transistor, he believed, would prove to be fragile and difficult to manufacture. Shockley was also dissatisfied with certain parts of the explanation for how the point contact transistor worked and conceived of the possibility of injection. On February 13, 1948 another team member, built a point contact transistor with bronze contacts on the front and back of thin wedge of germanium, proving that could diffuse through bulk germanium and not just along the surface as previously thought. Shive's invention spark had Shockley's invention of the junction transistor. A few months later he invented an entirely new, considerably more robust, type of transistor with a layer or sandwich structure. This structure went on to be used for the vast majority of all transistors into the 1960s, and evolved into the bipolar junction transistor. Shockley later admitted that the workings of the team were a mixture of cooperation and competition. He also admitted that he kept some of his own work secret until his hand was forced by Shive's 1948 advance. Shockley worked out a rather complete description of what he called the sandwich transistor, and a first proof of principle was obtained on April 7, 1949. Meanwhile, Shockley worked on his magnum opus, Electrons and Holes in Semiconductors which was published as a 558-page treatise in 1950. The tome included Shockley's critical ideas of drift and diffusion and the differential equations that govern the flow of electrons in solid-state crystals. Shockley's diode equation is also described. This seminal work became the reference text for other scientists working to develop and improve new variants of the transistor and other devices based on semiconductors. This resulted in his invention of the junction transistor, which was announced at a press conference on July 4, 1951. In 1951, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences, NAS. He was 41 years old, this was rather young for such an election. Two years later, he was chosen as the recipient of the prestigious Comstock Prize for Physics by the NAS, and was the recipient of many other awards and honors. The ensuing publicity generated by the invention of the transistor often thrust Shockley to the fore much to the chagrin of Bardeen and Braddon. Bell Labs management, however, consistently presented all three inventors as a team. Though Shockley would correct the record where reporters gave him sole credit for the invention, he eventually infuriated and alienated Bardeen and Braddon, and he essentially blocked the two from working on the junction transistor. Bardeen began pursuing a theory for superconductivity and left Bell Labs in 1951. Bratton refused to work with Shockley further and was assigned to another group. 
neither Bardeen nor Bratton had much to do with the development of the transistor beyond the first year after its invention. Shockley Semiconductor In 1956 Shockley moved from New Jersey to Mountain View, California to start Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory to live closer to his ailing mother in Palo Alto, California. The company, a division of Beckman Instruments, Inc., was the first establishment working on silicon semiconductor devices in what came to be known as Silicon Valley. His way could generally be summed up as domineering and increasingly paranoid. In one well-known incident, he claimed that a secretary's cut thumb was the result of a malicious act and he demanded lie detector tests to find the culprit. After he received the Nobel Prize in 1956 his demeanor changed as evidenced in his increasingly autocratic, erratic, and hard-to-please management style. In late 1957, eight of Shockley's researchers, who would come to be known as the Traitorous Eight, resigned after Shockley decided not to continue research into silicon-based semiconductors. They went on to form Fairchild Semiconductor, a loss from which Shockley Semiconductor never recovered. Over the course of the next 20 years, more than 65 new enterprises would end up having employee connections back to Fairchild. Personal Life Marriage and Children While still a student, Shockley married Iowan Jean Bailey at age 23 in August 1933. In March 1934, the couple had a baby girl, Allison. Shockley became an accomplished rock climber, going often to the Shawangunks in the Hudson River Valley, where he pioneered a route across an overhang, known to this day as Shockley's Ceiling. Shockley was popular as a speaker, lecturer, and an amateur magician. He once magically produced a bouquet of roses at the end of his address before the American Physical Society. He was also known in his early years for his elaborate practical jokes. Political Views Late in his life, Shockley became intensely interested in questions of race, human intelligence, and eugenics. He thought this work was important to the genetic future of the human species and came to describe it as the most important work of his career, even though expressing his views damaged his reputation. Shockley argued that a higher rate of reproduction among the less intelligent was having a dysgenic effect, and that a drop in average intelligence would ultimately lead to a decline in civilization. On a debate with Afrocentrist Francis Welsing he responded to a question as to whether black people are intellectually inferior because of their racial heredity with the following statement. My research leads me inescapably to the opinion that the major cause of the American Negro's intellectual and social deficits is hereditary and racially genetic in origin and, thus, not remediable to a major degree by practical improvements in the environment. Shockley's published writings and lectures to scientific organizations on this topic were partly based on the writings of psychologist Cyril Byrd and were funded by the Pioneer Fund. Shockley also proposed that individuals with IQs below 100 be paid to undergo voluntary sterilization. Anthropologist Roger Pearson, whose writings are based on an evolutionary and racialist approach, has defended Shockley in a self-published book CO authored with Shockley. University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee professor Edgar G. Epps argued that William Shockley's position lends itself to racist interpretations. Genetics He donated sperm to the Repository for Germinal Choice, a sperm bank founded by Robert Clark Graham in hopes of spreading humanity's best genes. The bank, called by the media the Nobel Prize Sperm Bank, claimed to have three Nobel Prize-winning donors though Shockley was the only one to publicly acknowledge his donation to the sperm bank. However, Shockley's controversial views brought the repository for germinal choice a degree of notoriety and may have discouraged other Nobel Prize winners from donating sperm. Relations with the Media In 1981 he filed a libel suit against the Atlanta Constitution after a science writer, Roger Witherspoon compared Shockley's advocacy of a voluntary sterilization program to Nazi experiments on Jews. The suit took three years to go to trial. Shockley won the suit but received only one dollar in actual damages and no punitive damages. Shockley's biographer Joel Shurkin, a science writer on the staff of Stanford University during those years, sums this up as saying that the statement was defamatory, but Shockley's reputation was not worth much by the time the trial reached a verdict. Shockley taped his telephone conversations with reporters, 
and then sent the transcript to them by registered mail. At one point he toyed with the idea of making them take a simple quiz on his work before discussing the subject with them. His habit of saving all his papers, even laundry lists, provides abundant documentation for researchers on his life. A group of about 30 colleagues, who have met on and off since 1956, met at Stanford in 2002 to reminisce about their time with Shockley and his central role in sparking the information technology revolution, its organizer saying Shockley is the man who brought silicon to Silicon Valley. Later years When Shockley was eased out of the directorship of Shockley Semiconductor, he joined Stanford University, where in 1963 he was appointed the Alexander M. Poniatoff Professor of Engineering and Applied Science, in which position he remained until his retirement as Professor Emeritus in 1975. Death Shockley died in 1989 of prostate cancer at age 79. By the time of his death he was almost completely estranged from most of his friends and family, except his second wife, the former Emmy Lanning, 1913-2007. His children are reported to have learned of his death only through the print media. Shockley is interred at Alta Mesa Memorial Park in Palo Alto, California.